So, pediatric heart failure. Similarly, as we were talking a bit about the status, uh, we'll go through some of the physiology. Um, but on the scene, I think the, the important thing is having some theoretical background so you can slot in likely what type this is as to what you might need to do. Uh, but the recognition is probably the most important part and the difficulty sorting out heart failure from respiratory distress, bronchiolitis, asthma, wheezing. Um, so definition of heart failure? We think it's crackles or wheezing in the chest. Um, but really, this is the more um, functional definition, where the heart can't meet the demands of the body, or meets it with really high filling pressures. Really, the usual one is the first one. Heart failure. The heart fails to give the body what it needs. So the body decides what it needs, and the heart has to meet it. The heart isn't the boss here. It doesn't do what it wants. It's trying to meet what the body needs. So when you go running, your heart has to speed up. You get a fever. You're seizing. Uh, you're hemorrhaging, whatever. The heart has to <coughs> work to meet it. And if it can't, then by definition, it's failure. Um, and one specific thing is, is being able to do it with really high filling pressures. Um, it's probably just a variation of circulatory failure. I think what the point was there is that um, you have signs of really high filling pressures, and that's what we often recognize. So uh, just to quickly remind us that the heart, the cardiac output, we can break it down in different ways heart rate and stroke volume. And this is still really useful for bedside tachycardia. Why is that fast? Not a very specific sign, fast for a lot of reasons, but a good trend to follow. Stroke volume, that's how much it pumps with each pump. We feel the pulse, we feel how strong the pulse feels as a proxy for the stroke volume. And changes with time. So we often talk about uh, heart failure and congenital heart disease. There are other types, such as myocarditis, um, that can be particularly treacherous because nowadays the congenital heart disease are pretty well all diagnosed at birth or uh, you know, very shortly thereafter. So you, when you see a patient out in the field somewhere, they'll, they'll come with that diagnosis already. So just the two uh, kind of, uh, or three great sort of categories, we think of volume overload. So there's too much blood whooshing through the heart and through the lungs uh, in an inefficient uh, pattern because it's shunting. So if too much blood is shunting left to right, then uh, the heart gets uh, overloaded in terms of volume because it's getting back the blood from the body plus the blood from the lungs. Uh, so it's pumping inefficiently. It's not all pumping out to the body, it's recirculating. So it's added a, a load right there. Valvular insufficiency is another form of volume overload. You shoot blood out and it just regurgitates back. So you get a bigger volume in the heart than you otherwise would. Um, so that, those manifest themselves as uh, uh, signs of over-circulation. The pressure loads um, manifest themselves more as under-circulation. So you've got severe obstruction on the, the left side of the heart. Um, in the infant, the aortic coarctation or severe aortic stenosis or presenting uh, around birth severe pulmonary stenosis, all cause um, heart failure in that there's a major obstruction to flow. And often if there isn't a relief path, uh, then they would be lethal. So if you see someone with these, they've often got some sort of shunt that lets blood go around or else they uh, probably wouldn't still be alive. Um, and then as we 
general rule when evaluating the circulation. This is the theoretical construct that we always try and use when we're deciding what we're going to do to treat whatever the problem is. Uh, that the cardiac output is determined by all these factors. Uh, rhythm being less common, but certainly when we have the SVTs that go on for a long time, uh, we can see that. Contractility uh, is a more difficult to quantitate uh, by just looking at the person. You have to infer it from a bunch of other things. And same thing with afterload, although by measuring a high blood pressure, we often infer there's a problem with afterload. So this all puts it together, and I like thinking of the relationships with this kind of thing <coughs> in mind. Particularly when we're talking about uh, our, is what's going on adequate for the patient? So the delivery of oxygen, the bottom line here, how much oxygen is getting to the body is really what's important. And at one level, we look at that as the amount carried in the blood, times the engine, the cardiac output. So this determines how much is delivered. If this is low or this is low and this increases, you can still deliver here. So someone with congenital heart disease and a SAT of 65 and a hemoglobin of 195 can have a quite adequate delivery. Someone drops their hemoglobin, but they increase their cardiac output, they can still deliver adequately. So we get the compensated and decompensated forms of problems going on. At what age do kids move away from being heart rate dependent to able to compensate with stroke volume? With their stroke volume? Uh, after the first months of life, I can't say an exact transition, but, but it's it much to more transition? marked. Yeah. Okay. Much more marked in the neonate, and then as the heart starts to enlarge, it goes from being this tiny little muscle-bound walnut to something that actually moves more. So after the first couple of months of life. Uh, so like we said before, the few things we can measure are blood pressure and heart rate, and then we infer a lot of um, the other things um, from those measurements. So our cardiac output, uh, if we up our blood pressure or drop our resistance, will increase output. And if we increase stroke volume, we're often manipulating this by giving preload. No one sick can pass by without getting 20 per kilo of saline, right? <laughs> Pretty hard, uh, whether they need it or not. Uh, the contractility, when we infer uh, poor pulses and perfusion, we infer there's a contractility problem, and we'll often use some sort of inotrope. Um, occasionally, there's primary afterload problems, so very severe hypertension, uh, but more often it's a matter of uh, the contractility is poor, so yes, we'll give something to up this a bit, and we'll give something to drop this a bit to both help this. So often it's a mixed mixed kind of uh, issue here, where it's not due purely to one. But we just want to remember these things because they all come into play when we're uh, trying to uh, modify our cardiac output. Uh, this just looks at the same thing. I'm not going to go over that again, but um, wall stress, pressure, being more theoretical, interesting, but not too much to our point. Uh, now, some people like me are more visual or like graphs. I can conceptualize the concepts about contractility better by looking at a graph. End diastolic volume here, cardiac output here. So, oops. Um, so this is preload, end diastolic volume. We can't often measure the volume, so we use pressure as a as a proxy, but. Just, just um, theoretically, we can see as we increase the preload, the cardiac output goes up, up to a point, 
And then if we give any more, it falls off because you've overfilled the heart and it can't pump efficiently anymore. Um, if we have poor contractility, everything operates on a lower output. So for a given preload, our cardiac output is less. So we move on a whole family of curves here. We've got hypercontractility, so we're being chased by a bear and our catacols are flying. For a given volume, that muscle is really squeezing now, so we'll have a higher output. So we can shift between curves and we can move up and down a curve. We give a catecholamine or we give an afterload reducer, we can move up on a curve. contractility is depressed and you give some volume, we can move up, but not as efficiently as if we were on a higher curve. Okay, so it's really a dynamic process where this is more a concept, like think of it as uh, we can move up and down or back and forth, depending on what we do. We can uh, twist that around a little more and look at afterload, where uh, here for a given stroke volume, we increase our afterload, we're going to decrease our cardiac output. Um, and if we had uh, normal contractility and we decrease our stroke volume, we don't affect pressure as much as if we've got diminished cardiac function. So um, some people like this, some people just glaze over when they look at it, but I say you can particularly this one look at it as a good con conceptual model of uh, what happens when you do different things like give a vasodilator, um, give an inotrope, give an afterload reducer. So, as a, a general response to inadequate cardiac output. Many of the manifestations we see are a result of this neurohumoral activation. So the body releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. Oops. Don't touch the device. Um, in response to the inadequate output, so we get vasoconstriction, increase the contractility, the inotropia of the heart, but there's an expense for that. So just like the seizing brain runs out of energy, uh, myocardium will be stressed further uh, in its energy demands by um, this process. Uh, calcium goes into cells and increases the inotropy, the contractility, but decreases the lucitropy. So the heart can't relax as well when you give calcium. So often as a um, emergent kind of measure and often a last ditch me measure, you'll give someone a bolus of calcium, pressure will come up transiently and then go down. That's because of its transient effect there. Uh, you also, your body also says, all right, we're not pumping as well, we can't be peeing so much. So the vessels constrict and we hang on to water. So the signs we see are due to some of these things, sweating, pallor, um, tachycardia, hypertension, all the guria are all due to this neurohumoral activation in response to the heart not doing what it can. Chronically, you get into other problems where the heart gets uh, overloaded. Uh, you can get hypertrophy, ischemia, problems with arrhythmia um, that go on when the problems are not uh, corrected. So we can have uh, acute versus chronic. Um, the more fulminant uh, acute cause that we see is uh, myocarditis, a previously normal heart that suddenly is very severe. Uh, you can also have patients who have chronic problems and are limping by and then they get an acute stressor like a viral infection or a fever that tips them over. Um, we mentioned lucitropy briefly, so that's diastolic heart failure where the heart doesn't relax very well. Uh, any hypertrophic heart will have that kind of problem. Um, so it can't fill as well, but also it can't contract and squeeze blood out. So there's those two components uh, to the problem. Um, 
I'm not going to go into uh, too much about this year. Again, just talking about uh, different uh, kind of things that can cause the different types of failure. So high output failure, that's uh, your sepsis, AVM. Someone's got a big AVM, they've got very low re vascular resistance and very high output. Uh, profound anemia, thyrotoxicosis, something you really see in kids. On the other end, the arrhythmias uh, is fast or too slow. And then all the intrinsic heart diseases where the heart just can't squeeze very well. Uh, the uh, diastolic failures are all those things that make the heart thick or that bind it. If you had a uh, pericardial disease, um, something that infiltrates the heart, some of these would be more adult diseases, but something that doesn't let the heart relax. So just another way of uh, looking at the different types of problems. Uh, the pediatric versions, again, the clinical manifestations are due to those neurohumeral activation. So the sweating, increased work of breathing, irritability, uh, poor feeding, failure to thrive. Um, if your cardiac output's inadequate, it diverts blood to the most critical organs, and uh, you often get side effects like uh, lung congestion. So between the tachycardia and the increased work of breathing, the difficulty with uh, breathing and feeding, you often have inadequate calories, failure to thrive, and it all um, uh, spirals kind of out of control. The big uh, difficulty when you first, if you just come across someone, uh, an infant, and don't know the history, is, oh, they look like they got bronchiolitis. So that's where the history comes in here. Well, this guy's pretty scrawny. Is there something going on cardiac, or has he had a long respiratory illness? Um, and so the history is really important here with uh, trying to differentiate the two, and sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to treat one, treat the respiratory part, and see if they get better, and then um, look at the heart. So when you're here, and you can slap an echo on right away, you can get a lot of info, but talking about in the field, it can be really hard to tell. Switch. Uh, so the general exam, um, cyanosis, as we all know, can be difficult to detect and can be unreliable and can mean peripheral, not central, and can mean oximeter to tell. Uh, all the general signs there are generally of uh, a lot to do with congestion. So if you've got uh, high filling pressures or high back pressure, your liver gets enlarged, your lungs get congested. Um, if you're older, you might, it might show up more as peripheral edema, and a baby might be edema in the face because they're lying down and their eyelids um, are likely to swell first. Um, the chest exam uh, can be really deceptive. Um, and again, if you have an x-ray, it's quite helpful. See a big heart, not a smaller heart. But if you're just looking, you can jump to the conclusion that this is a bronchiolitis or a pneumonia or pneumonitis. Um, so, and even a, a hepatosplenomegaly, well, they're hyperinflated. You can start explaining things. Well, the liver's a bit big because they're hyperinflated. It's pushed down. Um, so it's often the whole picture and how long it's been going on uh, just a caution about jumping to a conclusion. Because if you think it's a bronchiolitis and you start whacking them with Ventolin, um, that might be the worst thing for this sick, failing heart. To give a, you know, a dilator like that. But it happens all the time, right? Um, systolic heart failure, weak, dirty pulses. Pulse pressure, if you've got a leaky valve, might be really big. If you've got uh, poor systolic function, it can be quite narrow. Uh, gallops, the heart sounds, variable ability of people to pick those up. So it's nice if you hear a gallop, uh, but relying on these like accentuated second heart sounds. Realistically, unless you're quite experienced, you're not gonna reliably pick up those things. So. 
nice in theory, but I don't find so much so in practice. Uh, another way of looking at it is trying to classify wet or dry, cold or warm. Um, and so wet means that there's congestion. So the lungs are congested uh, if there's left-sided heart failure, and the body is congested if there's right-sided heart failure. So the pressure backs up on the right side, big liver, ascites, maybe edema, uh, left heart failure, left atrium enlarges, high pressure, lungs get congested. Um, so low perfusion um, is when you're cold, so there's poor systolic um, function of the heart, so that you're not uh, perfusing the tissues very well, you're hypotensive, tachycardic, cool, and then the wet stuff is hepatomegaly, tachypnea, orthopnea. And so you can have various combinations of these. And I don't think any, uh, often you don't fit totally into just one kind of category. Uh, cold and wet is really bad though. Uh, warm and dry is pretty good. And then you get all the kind of mixtures in between. So just trying to sort out what symptoms are due to which side of the heart is the way I look at it. Does that make sense? Uh, transport labs, yeah, it's nice to get some idea of uh, what's going on. Um, if you can get an x-ray and just say it's a big heart, it's a small heart, uh, the subtleties of curly V lines and vascular redistribution, not so much. Uh, pleural effusion could be confusing. Is this mean it's <coughs> pneumonia with infusion or is this heart failure? Um, I really think, uh, you know, send in a picture of x-ray to medical control is the way to go. But, but, but I mean, uh, same way with EKG and things, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, and get another pair of eyes looking at things. Uh, so we're seeing curly B lines here. Could have fooled me, but can't see it from here. <laughs> but in any event, it looks like a big heart. You see uh, increased vascular markings. Uh, I don't want to go into the theory too much, but in the normal compensation, when the left side pressures go up and the lungs start to get wet, fluid uh, goes into the lymphatics and then gets carried away through the thoracic duct and back to the body. And the lymphatics have an ability to increase their flow by about eight times before they get overwhelmed. And once the lymphatics get overwhelmed, then you start getting fluid collecting in the bronchovascular pedicle, where the pulmonary veins and lymphatics and the bronchial is. And once that starts getting congested, then you start to get wheezing. And when that gets more congested, the fluid's leaking into the uh, into uh, the septi and then into the alveoli, then you start to get crackles and more tachypnea. So by the time you start seeing wheezing, crackles, and tachypnea, you've really overwhelmed the system. So it can keep up for quite a while, till eight times the amount of fluid before you start getting these signs. So two takeaways from that for me. One, that you don't have to have wheezing and crackles to have increased flow. It just hasn't decompensated yet. So the absence of it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just maybe not that bad yet. And when you do see it, it's, it's advanced. You know, by the time you can clinically pick it up or see it on an x-ray, you're really into some florid problems. Uh, x-ray patterns, curly bees, uh, treatment. So, <clears throat> I would say, in my mind, this, this is helpful in rationalizing more what we're going to do. So if we see more signs that say, yeah, there's a lot of congestion, we'll do things for congestion. If we see things for low perfusion, we'll do things for that. So that's where uh, we then come down to 
deciding what our treatment's going to be. Um, history of it's always, you know, did this just start suddenly? Is this a known cardiac problem? Is it getting worse just over a few days? Did it start with a cold? Well, it's bronchiolitis. Well, but there was a history before. You know, all those things. Uh, it's a real challenge uh, in the undiagnosed kid to sort out uh, which this is. So we always just got to keep an open mind, especially in bronchiolitis season. You know, is this cardiac? Could this be cardiac? Am I missing the one out of all of them? Remember years ago, we had a kid in ICU with obstructed veins. I treated his bronchiolitis for two days till we could do it. You know, but didn't get better. You know, and it was right in the middle of bronchiolitis, and just you know, yeah, 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 another one. You know, so it's it's uh, it's always just in the back of my mind. You know, could have been missing something. Um, so, if you got good perfusion, but you're, uh, you got a lot of uh, wet lungs and edema, then what you want to try and do is remove some fluid um, and decrease the filling pressure. So, that's where we get into the afterload reduction and diuretics. Um, again, acutely and with transport, I think we definitely want to have a discussion before doing these things, just because someone like this has so little reserve. Um, you know, which way should we go? We should all share the misery of trying to decide. So we're unlikely to be using afterload reduction. Uh, diuretics might be something we want to try. Um, my argument would be for someone who presents with these cardiac things is that non-invasive ventilatory support is probably the best thing since sliced bread. But that's that's going to be the way to go. Um, it accomplishes a lot of things. Uh, when you're cold and wet, you're sicker. So now you've got a real issue with inadequate cardiac output, and you've got congestion in the lungs. You're on a really fine balance here. If you were to give someone a diuretic, because they're congested, their lungs seem wet, but they're adequate, they're not adequately perfusing, now you drop their preload and they're gonna crash. So, um, you know, that's where cold and wet, warm and wet comes in. Just that little extra, whoa, you know, let's try not to do any harm here. Um, again, uh, non-invasive support, I think should be the first line of choice. Similarly, yeah, uh, all right, so they're, they're just various degrees of things and uh, um, more for really intensive care rather than transport. You just want to get them back here alive. So the reason I say non-invasive support is that uh, it does so many things. It can improve lung congestion by recruiting lung volume. Uh, we know we don't decrease lung edema, but we push it out of the alveoli, more into the interstitium. We can decrease the width of breathing. We can improve our gas exchange. And at the same time, that positive pressure in the chest is an afterload reducer. So it can improve cardiac output. Why is it an afterload reducer? Anyone know? Certainly. Plus the respiratory people first. Any idea? Uh, it'll decrease PVR if it increases lung volume until uh, you get to that ideal lung volume, right? If the lung volume gets too big, PVR mm -hmm. goes up. Mm -hmm. And if it's too small, it goes up. So yeah, often in this circumstance where the lungs are wet, it's too small, it'll improve PVR. But it also afterload reduces on the systemic side. This concept's a little, little more esoteric. How can it improve afterload? How can it reduce afterload for the left ventricle? Because the right side of the heart isn't filling as much? Mm. Maybe more pressure on that? Not really, no. 
has to do with interthoracic yeah. pressure. Yeah, you got, you got interthoracic pressure, so it'll increase venous return to the heart? It should decrease, decrease. it a bit, because you've increased the pressure in the you chest. You explain this but the, blood, the lung volume supports the heart and its muscle and is not um, contracting as efficiently, right? So it will yeah. support the... Uh, So this is the chest, this is the heart, this is the left ventricle. Okay, so the left ventricle has to push blood out to the body here. Let's say there's a pressure of 100 in here. And uh, so the systolic blood pressure here is 100. And you're breathing spontaneously, and you're struggling and you're tugging, and the pressure here is minus 20. Okay, With negative pleural pressure as you breathe. So the pressure for this ventricle to eject blood out of the heart is 100, that's the blood pressure here, minus plus 20. the 20. So it's 120, the transpulmonary pressure. This is negative, I think of this as pulling this way, it's minus, and it's gotta overcome that and pump blood out, okay? So you put someone on positive pressure, and now this pressure in the chest goes to let's say plus five. So now the pressure across here 95. is 95. So you've effectively reduced the, the resistance, it's, well, it's the impedance to ejections, the actual technical term for that heart. So someone with, uh, let's say, a myocarditis or systolic heart failure with congested lungs and borderline blood pressure uh, putting them on non-invasive ventilation is going to improve all this without the risk of an RSI. And that's really the advantage. You say, well, why don't we just intubate them? Yeah. We might come to that if they're extreme, but if they can still ventilate and they're conscious, the risks of giving them a sedative and intubating them when they got really poor myocardial function uh, remember we've talked before that uh, ketamine with myocarditis can cause a fatal asystole. Um, anyone with poor cardiac function, you can really blunt all the catechols with the drugs we give. So they're in a dicey position. So if we can stabilize them non-invasively and get them to, to uh, improve, um, that might be the best thing to do. Uh, there's also literature supporting this and showing the improvement in function with non-invasive ventilation. Uh, you don't get that necessarily with high flow nasal cannula. You don't get that positive pressure effect. Um, so that's not a treatment of option. You're smiling. I don't like opti flow, so I'm just going to tell Ali that you said that. <laughs> Everything with its right place and indication, but there's nothing more dangerous than, than going off half cocked with the wrong treatment for a problem. Like we often see leakage where it's really good for decreasing work of breathing, lowering CO2 a bit in certain patients with hypercarbic and those problems. And if we translate that and say, well, it's good for that, it's good for this, it's good for this, and we don't have any evidence for that yet, uh, we can have problems where patients get worse on this high flow thing. Mm -hmm. It allows them to get by for a while, but they get worse and worse, and then we're really in trouble. Mm -hmm. So it's a, just a plea for the right treatment, for the right indication. And it's got its place, but it's not uh, the panacea for all kinds of problems. And uh, here, I think non-invasive support, plus minus some diuresis, plus minus some inotrope support depending on the clinical assessment. Is this mainly poor cardiac output? Is it mainly congestion? Uh, is it a bit of both? Um, is what we need. Sorry, so, you're saying it's trans-ejection pressure? Sorry? Your diagram, trans-ejection yeah. pressure? Trans-ventricular uh, wall oh. pressure. 
So just think in the aorta, the pressure's 100, and the ventricle here has to push blood against this 100 mm -hmm. in order to make blood flow, because that's the, let's say, the mean pressure in the aorta. So it's got to push it against 100. It's just a heart here, it's 100, but it's sitting in this negative chamber. Yeah. So it's got to overcome the 20 first, then nice. the 100. Yeah. So that's why they have to uh, Ketamine may be fed in the lungs catechol. Yeah. Mechanical ventilation, very useful. Said. Uh, and then we go through uh, all the inotropes. And again, I think it's really boring to sit and say what all the receptors are and what they do, but uh, it really helps to know what receptors things work on because then there's a rationale for the drug. So someone is warm and bounding and vasodilated, you need something mainly with alpha effect. Someone has very low uh, systolic pressure and congested lungs, then uh, maybe something like milrinone that's gonna decrease afterload and some inotropy. So the, if those provide the rationale for the drug rather than we just always use this or we always use that. So uh, it, de it depends and uh, Charts like this, I think, are helpful to refer to at the time uh, if you don't have it all sitting there in your head. Um, same thing here, more of the different receptors. Uh, yeah, never mind. <laughs> that might be yeah. it, yeah. Okay, so does that stuff make sense with heart failure? The big message is make sure that bronchiolitis is bronchiolitis and not heart failure. And when you think it's heart failure, or always keep heart failure in mind, particularly the myocarditis, because that's the one, you know, maybe it's only one a year, but you know, when we get bitten by that, it's, it's hard on everyone. Diagnose it right and have a big uh, management mm -hmm. uh, conundrum. Are there many symptoms with myocarditis that you'll see that are, you won't see in the bronchiolitis? So you're going to get a high fever sometimes, right? If you're going to get it or something. Yeah, you can get that in bronchiolitis too. too. Yeah, I know, but I think. The uh, heart, large heart, like. Yeah, the, the big, the big uh, differentiators are. Uh, there's a gallop, maybe a rub, uh, there's a big liver, poor pulses. Those are more the features you see with myocarditis. But all the pulmonary stuff overlaps. Right. Um, the kid who comes in with uh, wheezing, and there's everyone in the community is wheezing, and his two siblings had it, and he started with a, uh, with a runny nose and a cough, maybe more likely it's bronchiolitis. A lot of the myocarditis starts with a viral illness, so there's some fever and feeling unwell and something, you know, sore throat, so, you know, it can be misleading. And maybe the history of failure to thrive for, for, well, for kind of an illness, like the acute illness as opposed to... Oh, that's right, an yeah. acute presentation, yeah, that's right. Yeah, most of the myocarditis is acute. Right, yeah. Uh, that we see. Uh, those with a chronic cardiomyopathy usually are known beforehand. 